Okay. Good, good evening, um, everybody. It is a new seat activity. Thanks for Sun and our team who uh, try to get something new and useful for us. So this uh, journal club. And today we have uh, four speakers from four different countries and four panelists. Um, Dr. Harish is coming. And now we have a speaker from Thailand, uh, Philippines, Singapore, and Indonesia. So I would like to uh, start with introduce the first speaker, Dr. Shanut is a resident from Sirat Hospital, Thailand. He's a last year resident in Thailand. We have the five year training. So he is a fifth year resident. He is uh, going to, to present the article uh, about the conversion of wet to trochotomy and it is recently published. So uh, Dr. Shinoda, are you ready? Yep. Yep, so please. Uh, good evening, Professor and everyone. My name is Shinut Chatkel Paisan, the fifth year resident uh, from Siddharth Hospital, Bangkok, Thailand. Today, let me present the journal presentation. The topic is about the estimating the risk of conversion from video assisted thoracoscopic lung surgery to thoracotomy in systemic review and meta analysis. This paper is uh, done at Ohio State University of Columbia Disease at the University of America and published on the Journal of Policy Disease on 2021. For the introduction, uh, the video assisted thoracoscopic surgery or WAS is the most common minimal invasive approach for anatomical lung surgery of early stage lung cancer. The WAS allowed for smaller incisions, fever chest trauma, and impact mechanic of the respiratory system, which had been shown to result in the shorter hospital stays, lower rates of complication, and less pain when you compare to conventional thoracotomy. As the application of VAS expands recently, one of the concerns is increased risk of the conversion to open and possible complication. The risk assessment of the conversion and potential associated preoperative complication is important for preoperative considering. These preoperative considerations are critical for patients with marginal pulmonary function would be considered high risk for thoracotomy. There are several recent studies uh, identify the predictor of conversion, but the outcome of conversion is still inconsistent. Uh, so this paper conducts a systematic review and meta analysis uh, of existing literature on conversion of rats to thoracotomy for anatomy lung resection in three objectives. The first one is to define the incident and reason for rats conversion. The second one is to summarize the risk factor, and the third one is to assess the outcomes associated with conversion compared to a uh, complete breast procedure. For the method, uh, they conduct the systematic review of existing literature using the PubMed Light and Invest database. They prefer reporting items for systematic reviews and meta analysis or PRISMA standard. Uh, the search items are included in the best or thoracoscopy, or conversion, or thoracotomy, and the lung dissection. And the database was filtered by the most recent that filed up to the May 2020 and review a title and abstracts. Uh, the, the inclusion criteria for literature search were study limited to only in adult women and published in English version that met the criteria following. The first one is the study design is observational or clinical trial. The intervention are autonomic lung resection and evaluating primary plan vast procedure that were converted to thoracotomy. And the outcome are cause and all these factors for conversion and of course of morbid and mortality. And they include the case report, review articles, uh, abstract and study did not include either cause of conversion or this factor of post of the outcomes. This figure demonstrates the PRISMA outline selection of the study for review and meta analysis. Uh, you can see the, the record uh, took in by title. Uh, the first one had uh, have about 530, and then it could the 500 that not relevant of the study. So they had a 30 full text article access for eligibility, which they exclude 10 articles due to on the right side of the box. 
Yeah, so the final study, including this study, is about 20. The literature search was performed by two reviewers and analyzed for the results. Uh, the exact data from study that made inclusion criteria and review for variable, such as the type of study years, type of dissection, conversion layers, imagine conversions, listen for conversions, this factor for conversions, and post-operative outcomes such as complication, range of chest duration, being on hospital stay, and pre-op mortality. After that, the DAO, the BRAC assessment, uh, was used to evaluate each, each article quality. Uh, the DAO and BRAC assessment, as shown on the right side, uh, is a checklist on internal and external validity and the bias of the articles. The score of 0 to 9 is represent the low quality, 10 to 18 uh, is moderate quality, and 19 to 27 is a high quality. So this paper excludes the low, the low, low quality article. For the statistical analysis, uh, first they estimate the aggregate frequency of conversion uh, using the generalized linear mixed models, expressed median, median incidence rate of conversion as a proportion of conversion with another 5% constant intervals. And next, the meta analysis was performed for pre op outcomes of VAS conversion as compared to VAS using the random effect model method by the mental and Hansel and for the autonomous variable. And for clinical variable, they use the invariant variance. Aggregate effects measure were expressed as odd ratio for major and minor complication, specific complications such as uh, pulmonary and cardiovascular complication. They're using mean difference with 95% confident interval for shear cell duration and length of stays. Overall effect were assessed by the C test. Heterogeneity was tested by the crop can chi square test. And the two side p value less than 0 0.05 uh, were considered as a significant. And the reported bias may occur due to the different definition of complications or how ultimate cost of conversion. Several studies have varying definition of cut off for tumor size, causing conversion, and ultimately all decision to convert are the surgeon decided. The population bias may also exist in some study that higher rate of tuberculosis or fungal infection uh, that lead to the increase of addition in pulmonary cavity. For the result, uh, the 20 studies made the criteria to include in this review, including the 18 study with institutional data and two study with database studies. All studies were the retrospective observational studies and the DAO and back assessment were alleging about the 15 to 71 with a study with high quality and to be with moderate quality. The frequency of vast conversion was ranged from the one to 43% between study. A total of about the 74,000 uh, conversion uh, during the vast anatomic lung recession where the median incident was 9.6% with the uh, it will allow the 6.6 to the 13.9 percent, and the nice study reported 114 emergency with median incident rate of conversion about 1.3 percent. This table study is in vast conversion to the autonomy included in this meta analysis, and the higher rate, as you can see on this this table, is uh, by the professor Kim in Korea. That's about the 43 percent. And this picture is the uh, lowest led by the Professor Tong from China. That's about the about the one percent. And this table shows the reason for conversion to tolerotomy. The most common interoperative reason for conversion is the vascular entity operating is take about the twenty eight percent, and typical limb node dissection about the twenty twenty six percent, and the addition about the nineteen percent. The less frequency listen uh, are the tumor size, location, anatomy of body, incomplete feature, problem of sickle lung ventilation or oxygenation, and clinical issues. There were the 13 study uh, evaluated the least factor that may predict a conversion. The age was the least factor listed in seven study. One study reported age greater than 65 as a significant least factor and three study listed age at greater than 70 years and a significant risk factor. 
And tumor size was also reported as this factor in the five study, which range from the 1.4 to 4.8 centimeters. Also, male gender was a factor in four study, and injection therapy, injection therapy report in three study as a factor. While in some study, the injection therapy is an equation criteria. And the other risk factor are reported is the COPD, smoking, and increasing on board uh, urinary index. Uh, I will show this table again to consider in this factor for conversion in each study. About the post-operative outcomes, in aggregate, the study show an increase in overall complication for vast conversion compared to vast anatomical lung dissection in an odd ratio of about 2.06. Specifically, most study report increase in pulmonary complication about order 2.5 and cardiovascular complication with order 2.45. Moreover, the vast conversion were associated with increase in chest tube duration with an added mean difference about 1.6 and prolonging of stay with minifilin about the 1.8 days. Although the major complications and mortality rates were overall low, the vast conversion were associated with four times increase in odd ratio in early post of period of mortality. Uh, this figure show an association of post of uh, complication for vast conversion versus the vast. Uh, you see the odd ratio about the 2.06 on this one, as I mentioned before. And this picture shows the post operative uh, pulmonary and cardiovascular complication associated with vast conversion with the odds ratio about the 2.5 and 2.45. And this picture demonstrates the length of chest tube duration and capital stay associated with vast conversion. Discussion we separate into three, sub, three objectives. The first one is uh, to define the conversion rate and reason for conversions. In the meta-analysis of over, over 72,000 uh, vast procedures performed worldwide, the median conversion rate to thoracotomy was just under 10%, with length just span from the one to 43%. The variation likely difference in the patient selection Surgical experience and the operative volume. Uh, although the vascular injury of breathing was the most common reason for conversion, the imaging conversion was reported as a live event. Understand that indicate the safety of that approach. In contrary, most conversion were technical in nature due to the lymph node dissection, tumor site or location, and challenging in anatomy or adhesion. However, the surgical experience with VAS was shown to affect the conversion rate and explain in relation between study. A typical learning curve about the uh, which the Prato after uh, after Prato in operative times for anatomical lung dissection is significant decrease in conversion rate. From the paper from Kim in Korea report a high conversion rate about the 43% in her in his study, they discussed about the uh, conversion rate is about the 48% or on 2015 and decreased to 39% in 2016. And this paper was the lower case volume, which shows a lower learning curve of the surgeon. And the uh, uh, from the paper of the limb in Korea, uh, there was a uh, higher conversion rate, about the 73.4%. They report the higher incidence of the tuberculosis uh, and uh, associated the anticoagulosis and adhesion. Uh, for the Samson report in USA with a high rate of conversion because he had a high rate of histoplasmosis uh, that is typical for no dissection. And a study from Puri in uh, USA State of America reported the case in conversion rate over three years that the evidence of increase in surgical experience. Beyond the original learning curve, conversion largely due to the oncologic lesion larger tumors, limb node disease, or post-induction dissection. The operative strategy developed for managing baths or breathing, which is the most common cause of which typically the compression, dilate cautery for bronchial artery, and maybe the pulmonary artery repaired by the experienced surgeon with application of creeps or small bands for the surgery or the small control. The second 
uh, objective is uh, to summarize the risk factor for conversion which relation between the study due to various in patients, disease, uh, and radi radiology characteristic. The lymph node disease or radiographic classification of uh, intercoronary lymph nodes was the most consistent risk factor for conversions. Others reported the risk factor were advanced age, male, large tumor, and addiction therapy. The tumor size associated with the conversion layer rarely from the 1.4 to 4.8 centimeters. Several studies treated induction therapy as an exclusion criteria, while the other did not Few studies comment on acceleration of male gender, which may be the male gender head order and higher rate of polar revision that it counted for related to the conversion layers. And the robotic assisted telescopic may reduce the risk of conversion. The third objective is the, to determine the outcomes associated with breast conversion. Some studies reveal increase of morbidity from conversion, but others do not. Uh, in the meta analysis, we demonstrated the conversion to telecotomy associated with twofold increase uh, communication rate compared to breast compete for years. Particularly, study reported increase in the pulmonary and cardiovascular events after the conversion, which may be caused by the chest wall trauma associated with increased epithelial mechanic, especially in the patient with the vaginal pulmonary function. Conversion to telecotomy result in increased chest stimulation length of stay as compared to vas compete for years. Three studies show no difference between the morbidity and mortality between vas converted to telecotomy and clad telecotomy. However, with the increased power of metalysis, uh, the paper demonstrated an increase in mortality risk associated with conversion to telecotomy. There were several limitations in this study, which caused by the any accurate of data analysis. The experience and operative volume of surgeons may vary between study and the specific vast technique number of ports were not standard. Another limitation is variation in criteria for vast selection which included uh, the characteristics such as the larger or central tumor, lymph node disease, PVH, previous induction therapy. And the cause of conversion due to lymph node dissection may also be affected by the patient population. For Masaoka in Japan, they reported 10 interval conversion patients for silicotic lymph node, had history of dust inhalation, and from the professor lymph in Korea reported high sin of tuberculosis and histoplasmosis. Another limitation in this review includes the location of the tumor. The location of tumor in conversion groups was reported in nine study, but only one study uh, linked the location is actual reason for conversion. Additionally, the section central tumors may pose a greater risk of vascular injury that leading to a greater number of conversion. The public publication bias may affect estimation of emergency conversion less, which are rarely reported in the study, and this is the Review and meta analysis synthesized the current published data on vast conversion thus far to help the advance our professional practice in the future. So, the conclusion the risk of conversion to telecotomy during vast for antibiotic lung decision is approximately 10%, which is the most common reason are uh, vascular injury or breathing, difficulty in restriction, and addition requiring the telecotomy. The clinical limb node disease and classification may predict an increased risk of conversion. Vast conversion to telecotomy are uh, associated with the uh, increased risk for post of mobility or mortality uh, to be similar to conversion outcomes after planned telecotomy for anomic lung dissection. And this summary finding can serve as a benchmark for the surgeon when comparing their own outcomes with vast as well as global different for the future studies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shinod. If anyone has any question regarding the article, uh, Susan uh, Edmund, uh, this is quite a, a large survey. So how many patients are together? The question. Yes. How many yeah, patients? They included uh, seventy-seven thousand and four hundred uh, total economy. Review. 70,000. About the 70. Oh, uh, no, no, uh, 7,400. 7,400. 
เป็นทาวเทอร์ฟอร์เดบัตแอนด์อ่อคอนเวอร์ชันคอนเวอร์ชันอ่าดูดูบัตคอนเวอร์ชันคอนเวอร์ชันนี่เป็นเป็นทาวเทอร์ so all together the the bat patient seventy ah seventy thousand right yup ah uh, I mean they include only the the patient who go on the bat converted to the hotomy that include about the seven thousand four hundred patient Yes, yes, but the, you said that the conversion rate is ten percent. So the total yes, about ten percent should be around seventy thousand. Oh yes, yeah, yes, maybe like that. A huge number, and the cost of conversion is quite, you know, uh, what we uh, facing every day. So the n o d e dissection and the the vascular bleeding. And you mentioned that uh, with the history of the some sort of infection like h i s t o p l a s m o s i s the limb r e c e s s i o n will become the problem, right? Yeah, maybe they call it h i s t o p l a s m o s i s Yes. How about the experience from Philippines and Indonesia, when the patient has coexisting uh, inflammatory condition? Yes. yes uh, yep. Please, go ahead. Please, please. please. <laughs> yes, we, we we do have uh, conversions, but a lot of them are because of technical reasons. Um, a very few uh, because of vascular uh, trauma, because of vascular injury. So a lot of them is because of the dense adhesions. We we do attempt in in um, almost all cases. That we do, uh, that we try to do it through vats, through minimally invasive. We would often uh, add additional ports and see how far we can go uh, with with the vats. And once we see that uh, you know we're not progressing anymore, then we do convert. So a lot of these uh, conversions are not um, emergency conversions uh, because of vascular injury. Mm -hmm. Susan, how about you? Um, same same situations with Edmund, but um, uh, we always have to encourage our our colleagues to to just try to start the fats, because however we have to start uh, uh, no matter if we have to convert to open t h o r a c o t o m y And I would like to ask uh, questions. So, um, uh, what is the benefit? Of reading this journal, uh, particularly for uh, for those who who just start the fats, uh, do you think this journal is encouraging or or discouraging for for us to start the fats with the possibility to convert to thoracotomy? Thank you. Before that, I should not ask this question. I would like to welcome Dr. Harish. He's Hi. Uh, hi, Harish. Uh, sorry, I came in a bit late. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. I, um, I only caught towards the talk towards the ending. I apologize. So, have you listened to the the article? Uh, unfortunately, uh, no. Uh, but um, I think uh, I, I got the gist of it that the uh, the reason for conversion to a to a thoracotomy. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, one thing I, I I like to always put out is that um. Uh, when starting up vets, um, um, I, I, a lot of times we we don't do posterior lateral thoracotomies anymore. Um, so our outcomes are actually uh, I wouldn't say similar to vets, but I think uh, it's approaching closer to it because we're doing more lateral thoracotomies. Um, so we perform a uniportal vet, but sometimes we extend the incision to maybe about normal uniport is four four centimeter, sometimes five centimeter incision. And uh, you know we can extend the incision to about 12, 12, 13 centimeters in length, and uh, perform a lobectomy that way. There's a lot of adhesions, or we feel that uh, dissecting the vessels, um, you know, it's a, a lot of desmoplastic reaction around the vessels. Uh, and really, the outcomes um, are quite good, I would say. You know, um, and a lot of times we can check. Sometimes, if a COPD patient. Uh, You can um, uh, put buttress sutures uh, on the lung much more easily without tearing them. Um, 
and uh, with the use of on cue pump also uh, right now um, the outcomes are also pretty decent of course that is much better uh, but uh, um, I, I think uh, um, the outcomes is, are quite good with a lateral thoracotomy okay so that you know would you please answer uh, susan's question yep yeah uh for me uh i think the the benefit of breath is the superior than the thoracotomy in in every aspect uh but uh, i think the, the the experience is the important factor for for the conversion rate because uh, when I'm finished the study, I will try to go on the west, but uh, under the guidance of the, of the senior professor. And I think that the, this paper is uh, encouraged me to, to go on the west, uh, but under the guidance on the period of the learning curve. Yeah. Um, can I just bring up one point to, to the trainees here? Is that performing vets, of course, will be your ultimate uh, goal at the end of the day. Um, but what's important is don't try to compromise the patient. If you can do a lobectomy through a lateral thoracotomy and do it in two hours. It's better than trying to do a uniportal vet and doing it for six hours. Uh, you know, you're not going to benefit the patient that way when you struggle. And the longer you perform and it's a difficult dissection and you find it difficult, uh, the outcomes are much poorer um, that way. So... Um, I think if you're going to take more than two hours or two and a half hours to do a lobectomy by vets, um, and then you must consider uh, changing your view on, on, on these things. And, and you will progress with time. Yeah, you'll progress with time, but um, uh, you, know, you, you keep trying. So maybe you take maybe the first two hours and you find out you're still struggling, then you, you should try to convert. And then you get better with time. I think that's how everybody practices and, and, and goes from there. But you shouldn't take six hours to do a VAT. Uh, that's compromising the patient. It's higher GA risk, and, and it goes on down the list. Thank you. There's a comment from Dr. Prunkiat in the chat that uh, it is an interesting finding that one of the reasons is inadequate limb node dissection. So they think for lung cancer case, um, adequate limb node dissection is very important. But if you find that with VATS, you cannot do complete dissection, it may be worth you know, uh, extending extension to, to get complete limb node dissection. So that's another point. And we have a question uh, from who? Uh, regarding location as a factor for conversion to cosmology, what are the most Notorious locations. I'm not sure whether the article may not mention in detail. What we expect is the nearer to the higher structure, the more higher rate of conversion. Dr. Soon asked a, a question on um, what cases will you proceed to thoracotomy right from the start? Uh, for me, it's tumor size. Um, I, I know there are a lot of surgeons who perform, you know, 10 centimeter tumors by vets. Um, uh, Dr. Sun, just to your answer, I, I think you just got to have a cutoff point that you understand whether you can deliver the tumor out. Um, if you have a 50 kilo lady that's very small size with a narrow rib space uh, and it's a tumor that's six, seven centimeters, uh, I think... Um, that, you know, I, I don't know what benefit it is by performing VATS because you're going to have to extend that incision anyway after that. And of course, I agree the idea is not to spread the rib, but eventually you will have some rib spreading to pull the tumor out. Um, you know, until, until you become very competent and a, a very senior surgeon where you can do it properly, I think uh, for, for uh, junior uh, surgeons, you should uh, start with the smaller tumors and progress uh, as you get better. And one important thing where people always say, I do vets, do vets with large tumors, is that you've got to ensure that you don't break the tumor. And if the tumor is sitting right at the visceral pleura, at the capsule, and it's a big tumor, um, you have to be careful because if you break the tumor, you can get tumor spillage, and that becomes an issue for you. For um, inflammatory conditions, to answer the question of Dr. Soon, for inflammatory conditions, if you have uh, a contracted chest wall, uh, if you have... Um, like a uh, uh, um, ipsilateral shifting of the mediastinum, the heart, and the, the, the space is quite narrow because you have a, a probably a destroyed lung 
on that side and you have to do surgery, then, you know, these are some of the, the indications for you to probably uh, consider doing open instead of uh, uh, doing it through VATS because it will be difficult for you to work on a very narrow space and even entering the, the chest wall is already difficult because of the narrow uh, interspace. For me, another cases that I would avoid when I begin my web lobectomy is the patient with calcified N1 lymph nodes. It's very difficult to take those lymph nodes out from the PA and the bronchus. And so for the beginner, I think we should avoid the cases with calcified lymph nodes in the N1 stations. I think the time's uh, moving. Um, shall we go to our next uh, speaker? This one would be. Would yeah, be, I'll be. Yep. Edwin. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Knut, Dr. Poon, for that, um, <clears throat> that, that presentation. Um, the, the next presenter is Dr. Um, Roari Lee. Uh, he is a. Uh, uh, he completed his general surgery residency at St. Luke's Medical Center. Uh, he is a board certified general surgeon. And well, as you all know, in the Philippines, we follow the American system of uh, postgraduate education. So we call uh, our subspecialty trainees fellows, fellows in training. He is, uh, he is a second year uh, fellow in uh, thoracic surgery at the Lung Center of the Philippines. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Lee. Can you share your slides? Hello, good evening, everyone. Sir, can, uh, can you see my slide, sir? Yes. Am I clear also, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So good evening, Dr. Villarman, uh, the panelists and all our attendees. Uh, my name is Dr. Ruari Lee. I'm from uh, Thoracic Surgery Fellow in the Lung Center of the Philippines. So I will be presenting a journal. So the outline of my presentation is as follows. I will be presenting a hypothetical case first, and then I will discuss the journal uh, in question and then critical appraise the journal. So uh, we begin with a hypothetical case, a 44 year old male with an incidental finding of a non-calcified nodule at the right upper lobe measuring 0.2 centimeters, 1.5 centimeters from the visceral pleura. So this article is, uh, was found in the Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery uh, dated last uh, 2018. So for the, yes. So for the review of related literature, uh, there are various ways on how to biopsy a suspicious pulmonary nodule. Uh, the techniques of which are through bronchoscopy, through percutaneous needle biopsy, and sometimes it is indicated to do VAT sweat resection, especially in small size peripheral lesions which are close to the visceral pleura. Uh, so we are able to biopsy suspicious nodule by several means, uh, one of which is through bronchoscopy, uh, another way is through percutaneous needle biopsy, and sometimes VAT, VAT sweat resection is uh, indicated, especially uh, when we have small size peripheral uh, lesions which are close to the visceral pleura. A suspicious nodule must be marked to be able to localize it during the VATS procedure. So there are several ways we could do this. We could uh, use a hook thread, a spiral wire needle, a microcoil, or a fiducial marker. Sometimes a colored dye can be used, uh, which is usually injected via CT guidance uh, uh, in the lung near the target lesion. Uh, samples of dyes that can be used uh, are methylene blue, barium, or lipidiodol. Uh, for this paper, it focused on the use of uh, this dye called indocyanin green, uh, which is uh, uh, injected into the lung parenchyma via CT guided percutaneous injection, or it can also be uh, injected through bronchoscopic means. 
So the advantages of endocyanin green dye localization is that it's, uh, the dye is usually always detectable regardless of any changes in color or texture of the visceral pleura uh, because it uses a spectrum of uh, wa a special wavelength to be able to eliminate it uh, even if there are uh, cases of anthracotic lungs or lungs with other underlying pathologies. So the, uh, the endocyanin green dye is usually detected by a th uh, INR thoracoscopy up to a depth of around 20 millimeters from the visceral pleura. Uh, it's also uh, very advantageous because it does not affect the pathologic examination because it, uh, it's uh, diluted before it is injected. And also it is excreted by the body uh, through uh, renal clearance. So going back to the paper, uh, this, pap this paper is a prospective Sorry. This, this paper is a prospective clinical trial, a, actually a case series. And the study period uh, is between January 2013 up to December 2016. Uh, for this study, they were able to recruit 37 patients, wherein uh, 15 patients underwent CT guided percutaneous marking uh, from January. Uh, 2013 to December 2014. And they were also able to recruit 22 patients who underwent bronchoscopic marking from January 20, 2015 to December 2016. Uh, all patients uh, had uh, informed consent and the paper was uh, approved by the Institutional Review Board of Kochi Medical School, Kochi University. So for the methodology, uh, an ICG iopamidol mixture was aspirated into a 1 ml syringe, and this syringe was attached to a percutaneous or bronchoscopic needle. For the VATS marking procedure, uh, the patient is usually in a supine or prone position, depending on the uh, location of the lesion. And after a preliminary scan, and uh, the patient was uh, anesthetized locally, uh, a 23-gauge needle was filled with marking solution uh, and injected near the pulmonary nodule. Uh, 50 microliters of the ICG iopamidol marking solution was injected under real-time imaging using CT fluoroscopy. So these are the images, uh, uh, representative images in the study, wherein they were able to inject the dye uh, near the pulmonary nodule in question. So after injection, they monitored the patients uh, by performing a CT scan every 30 minutes to be able to monitor for the occurrence of pneumothorax. Uh, the total duration of each procedure was within 90 minutes. And uh, to be able to uh, address the possibility of late onset pneumothorax, uh, the surgery was done in the afternoon of the same day the localization was done. For the bronchoscopic parking procedure, uh, the virtual bronchoscopy navigation images were generated from a CT DICOM uh, to be able to localize the lesion via the virtual bronchoscopy unit. So after the airway was topically anesthetized uh, and moderate, moderate sedation was induced, a flexible bronchoscopy was then inserted nasally into the tracheobronchial tree. Uh, while viewing the virtual bronchoscopy navigation images, the tip of the bronchoscope was guided to the peripheral bronchus near the target lesion. Uh, after which, the transbronchial aspiration cytology needle uh, was inserted into a sheath uh, into the access port of the flexible bronchoscope uh, into the target lesion. The needle was exposed 1 cm from the sheath, uh, 1 centimeter outside the sheath, and then both the sheath and the needle were advanced uh, further to be able to puncture the lung parenchyma into the target lesion in question. Uh, as with the uh, CT percutaneous uh, marking, monitoring was also done for patients who underwent bronchoscopic marking. Uh, CT scan was performed 
uh, but only once post procedure and the total duration of the procedure was uh, less I uh, finished within 30 minutes and uh, the surgery was done the day after localization was done. So during the said procedure, a thoracoscopic uh, NIR fluorescence detection and video assisted thoracoscopic wedge resection was done. So here you can see in the picture, uh, the illuminated uh, area where the ICG dye was uh, injected. So the ICG fluoroscopy was visualized using the endoscopic fluorescence imaging system. And once they were able to visualize the uh, localized area of the lung, they did a uh, wedge resection uh, to be able to include the pulmonary nodule in question and to be able to confirm that the nodule was indeed excised, a confirm confirmation with a uh, frozen section was done. So statistical analysis for this uh, study was used uh, in the form of chi-square test or Fisher exact test with a uh, significance of 0 0.05 and they used a SPSS version 17.0. For the results of this uh, paper, so as we mentioned, they were able to recruit 37 patients and uh, um, out of the 37 patients, 15 patients underwent percutaneous CT guided marking. Uh, all of the patients who underwent CT guided marking had ICG fluorescence detected, and all of the nodules uh, for this group was uh, documented by uh, via pathologic diagnosis right after the surgery. However, uh, three out of the 15 patients had a occurrence of pneumothorax after the CT-guided uh, marking procedure. And actually, one of those patients who, un who had a pneumothorax had supposedly two nodules to be localized. So since uh, uh, pneumothorax occurred in that specific patient, uh, the marking of the second nodule was uh, deferred. So, uh, for those who underwent bronchoscopic marking, uh, 22 patients out of the 37 patients underwent this procedure. And ICG fluorescence was detected uh, in 20 out of the 22 patients who underwent bronchoscopic marking uh, with a accuracy of 19.9%. Uh, out of those 22 patients, 16 patients had single nodules to be uh, localized. And out of those 16, uh, one had failed uh, ICG fluorescence. After which, uh, after that, uh, there were also six patients who had two nodules to be localized, and out of those six patients, one of the one uh, failed because of uh, injected marking thirty millimeters from the visceral pleura. So these two patients who had uh, failed uh, ICG fluorescence uh, were carried out using palpation to be able to localize the nodules in question. So for the discussion, uh, so the fluorescence, uh, the ICG dye was injected near the tumor cells rather than within the tumor uh, to be able to decrease the risk of spreading tumor cells. And uh, the paper also discussed regarding the advantages and disadvantages of both percutaneous and bronchial marking. Uh, the advantages of uh, city-guided percutaneous marking involves uh, not being dependent on the bronchial branching uh, with a success rate of 100%. And also uh, there's a uh, advantage in cost since uh, less equipment is needed to be able to perform city-guided percutaneous marking. The advantages of, uh, of which is that there is a chance of pneumothorax. Uh, for this paper, it was around uh, 20%. So since uh, this occurred, patients with uh, multiple nodules to be localized uh, has an increased chance of uh, not being able to localize the second uh, nodule or thereafter. For the bronchial marking, 
the advantages of which is that it is able to localize multiple nodules uh, and it is able to reach me the mediastinal area and the area under the scapula, uh, both of which uh, both of which areas are uh, not very ideal for CT guided percutaneous marking. However, the disadvantage of having a bronchial uh, marking is that it has a lower success rate as, in, as seen in this study with a success rate of only 90.9%. So for the conclusion of this study, ICG fluoroscopy has good detectability. Uh, it is capable of deep tissue penetration and is distinguishable regardless of the tissue background or color. For bronchoscopic marking, uh, it has an uh, advantage over CT-guided percutaneous uh, marking because it is able to localize multiple nodules without the risk of pneumothorax. Okay, uh, Dr. Lee, you will probably uh, end your uh, presentation there in the interest of time. Okay, sir. Uh, are there any questions uh, with regards to this, uh, this uh, uh, journal? So this is a, a, a case um, case series. Basically, there, there are no controls, uh, um, control population in this uh, study. So what do you think uh, is the, the clinical benefit of, uh, you know, using case series uh, in this uh, in this scenario? What what can we what can we achieve uh, from from this uh, particular study? Uh, sir, for uh... Cases like this wherein the technology is relatively new, I think uh, it is important to establish first uh, any, any signs of benefit for a procedure to be able to carry out more uh, complicated and more robust studies such as a randomized control trial. Yes, this, uh, this is a fairly, um, among the um, levels of evidence, a fairly low level a case series, but it does have uh, benefits uh, for for new uh, technologies, um, so we can use this to to develop um, hypotheses for further studies uh, later on. So, yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> how, uh, Doctor Lee? How was the, the patients um, group um, into having uh, bronchoscopic mm -hmm. versus a uh, percutaneous? Uh, localization uh, using ICG? Uh, sir, for this paper, I think they did uh, what we call a purposive sampling, wherein they just delegated a time frame uh, to be able to uh, recruit patients into a certain group. So for example, in this study, they allocated two, the first two years of the study, January 20. 13 up to December 2014 for those patients who will undergo city guided percutaneous drainage. It just so happens that during that two years time frame, they were, in, they were in, only able to recruit 15 patients. Uh, for the next two years of the study, uh, they, they shifted to recruiting patients under the bronchoscopic marking arm. And fortunately they were able to recruit more patients here, but, uh, of 22 patients out of the 37. So they did uh, they did recruitment via purposive sampling, sir. Okay, so any other comments from the, the panelists or if you have any questions, uh, type them uh, in the chat box. Okay, so if there are none, I think we have um, two more um, presenters. Um, thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reed, for your for your talk. Um, uh, the next um, um, doctor going to present is actually Dr. Lee Wei. Uh, Dr. Lee Wei is, uh, was one of our senior residents in NUH, and he passed his uh, FRCS uh, exam um, about two months ago. So congratulations to you, Dr. Lee, and uh, uh, welcome on board to becoming a full-fledged thoracic consultant. Uh, he should thank be joining you. us uh, as an associate consultant uh, in our department soon. And uh, Dr. Lee today will, uh, will present uh, his talk on management of complications after lung resection. 
uh, especially for prolonged air leak and bronchopleural fistula. So take it away, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Harish, for your kind introduction. Uh, actually, uh, this presentation is mainly to address the issue of prolonged air leak. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the bronchopleural fistula. This presentation is a combination of these three articles, as I mentioned here. And uh, from the poster, I'm sorry, because that poster can only include one of the papers. So uh, without further delay, I will start my talk. So air leaks, why is important? First of all, because it's very common for lung surgeons. It is uh, reported to be present in up to 60% of patients immediately after lung surgeries. And uh, up until BOD4, 8% of them are still having persistent air leak. And to define a prolonged air leak, uh, well, our Euro definition is beyond post op day five. And why is that? Because uh, according to the STS database, the average length of stay for patients after lobectomies are five days. That's why STS uh, defined as any length of pro air leak after that length of stay is prolonged. So as we all know, prolonged air leak is associated with multiple complications. Uh, as we all know, the length of stay and the cost. But furthermore, without the prolonged air leak, patient will have the tube longer time so associated with pain and uh, with the uh, unexpanded lung, patients are more prone to have pneumonia and unpaima will ensue with uh, infective space. And with the less mobilities, patients may have more prone to have venous thromboembolic events and ICU stays. And it is also reported that patients with prolonged air leak have 3.4 times greater risk of death compared to those without the prolonged air leak. That's why we need to address this issue. So risk factors, when we see a patient in clinic, what are the characteristics that make us suspect this patient may suffer from an air leak after the surgery? These are the few points. So advanced age, low BMI and low, low IPV1 and COPD patients because their reserves are low. So they are more prone to have complications. Smokers, diabetic patients and uh, patients on chronic steroids, their tissue are more uh, fragile and uh, slower to recover. And if patients have previous infection of the lung or previous chest surgeries, they are more prone to have adhesions. So adhesiolysis is another risk factor for prolonged air leak. If patients have incomplete fissure, we'll do a lot of fissure dissection that leave us with more raw surface. And of course, the air leak will persist longer. And upper lobectomies or upper bilobectomies or post op mechanical ventilation are both are independent risk factors for this phenomena. So, some surgeons have tried to give us a calculating system to predict patients of their ratio of developing a prolonged air leak uh, from the pre op characteristics. Uh, take these two calculators as example. So, both of them are trying to to list out the risk factors and give them each of them points. So basically the more points you add, the more percentage of patients will have a prolonged air leak. Like this table, the, this Dr. Brunelli, uh, his model will, will differentiate patients into a few degrees or categories. Uh, if the patient has zero score calculated from this calculator, the chances of a prolonged air leak will be as low as 1%. But if they have more than three points, the chances of having a, a prolonged air leak will be as high as 30%. So I think not every patient will need to calculate such score, but in determining our uh, uh, consulting to patients before the surgery uh, for high-risk patients, it might be beneficial to have this uh, tools in mind. So as we all know, prevention is better than cure. So the principle of intra prevention includes the following. The principles to eliminate that space to achieve apposition of the visceral pleura to the parietal pleura or to the transposed tissue. Uh, also in to address the pulmonary resection beds, the raw surface or the staple line itself. Uh, one of the simplest things you can do during the surgery is to mobilize all intra pleural adhesions and then divide the inferior pulmonary ligament so the lung can move more freely and fill up the space 
easily. And if you find signs of like early empyema, there's a pill forming, decorticate them all. So the lung can fill that pleural space more properly. And this table gives us a summary of depending on anatomical structures to how to, what things we can do in the operation to prevent air leak. Like targeting the parietal blue rock and the parietal tent, parectomy, rodesis. Targeting visceral pleura, we can do a tissue lysis and decortication, as I mentioned just now. Diaphragm, we can do preventative pneumoperitoneum and or phrenic nerve paralysis to raise the diaphragm, occlude the space. For the chest wall, we can do transposition of the muscle flaps or rib resection. Uh, we can even mobilize the momentum to the chest cavity to fill the space. But I think most, most of the case for, for bronchopleural fistula surgery. And uh, these measures, combining with a uh, spirit of commercial available sealant and mesh on that, they can be time consuming and uh, costly. So not all patients will need them. And that's why we need the uh, risk calculators to help us to guide which other patients who have more prone to have prolonged air leak issues. So coming into details of all these techniques, pleural tent basically is more useful for upper lobe or upper bilobectomy patients. Basically, it will detach the visceral pleura, the parietal pleura from the endothoracic fascia and, uh, make, <coughs> and uh, drop them to cover the resected lung surface. You can choose to stitch the free edge of the bisected pleura to the intercostal space. And uh, there are several studies to show this association between this technique and decreased duration of post op air leak. Uh, preventative pneumoperitoneum is another technique. It's designed for more for lower lobectomies or lower bilobectomies. Uh, you can use a trans diaphragmatic approach, means from the chest through a post string, the diaphragm, place the catheter through the diaphragm, or you can through a trans abdominal catheter from the outside to inject air into the abdomen to push up the diaphragm. You can achieve the similar purpose by transiently paralysis the phrenic nerve by injecting local anesthetics. And uh, there are pro prospective double arm trials showing the patients with such techniques have fewer incidents of uh, prolonged air leaks. Stapulum bar tracing is another technique. So, uh, so we all know that a staple line may be a source of leak. So multiple surgeons have, have tried multiple materials to cover the staple line, including sutures, pericardium, or Teflon patch, or the polyglycolic acid mesh or PGE mesh, which we'll touch up even more later. Uh, it is found to be more effective for lung volume reduction surgery patients. And uh, the data for anatomical lung resection patients are less robust at the present time. And the surgical sedents, I think most of, most of surgeons will be familiar with this. Uh, commonly, we use fibrin sedents. They are usually, they are initially designed for hemostasis purpose. I will adopt this for trying to do pneumostasis. There are another type of sedents which are PEG based. Uh, they, were, they were once developed in the US and approved, but it's quite low adoption rate. And I think I consulted uh, in the industrial friends and think the products are not available in Singapore at least. Uh, there are trials to show that these sedents uh, can decrease intraoperative air leak. That means when you check under the Say line, you can see less bubbles after you spray the sealants, but not uh, not always translate into a reduced post-op air leak or prolonged air leak rate post-op. So currently, the evidence to support the sealants, routine use of these sealants, are not as robust. But then, because of the fibrin is used for hemostasis purpose as well, so uh, I think and some 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 surgeons will still use it to cover the vascular stumps. And pleural mesh. Uh, it is more common to be called a uh, PGE mesh. It is uh, designed to augment the effect of sublobal resections like segmentectomies because initial problem after segmentectomies is the lung stapling line try, will leak more air and initially surgeon is trying to suture but suturing will have one problem is to decrease lung re-expansion that that is diminishing the benefit of lung preserving surgery. That's why the mesh was 
designed and introduced. It is uh, observable, there's no lambda immune response. The PGA actually the same material we use for softball sutures like Vicro. Uh, it has been shown by applying this sealant soaked PGA mesh for patients who have intro op air leak. Their chest tube duration is comparable to those who has no intro op air leak. Uh, this study was done in Japan. Uh, so it is not a direct comparison. Uh, they don't uh, group like patients who have intra op air leak into treatment or control group. Rather, they treat all the patients who have intra op air leak with such sedan soaked mesh and they compare with those patients who have no intra op air leak and they can achieve a similar outcome, which is quite encouraging. Uh, in fact, our hospital have adopted this mesh for intra op air leak prevention since last year. And we can, I, can, I can say we have quite good results and hopefully more, more, more studies will come out from, for this mesh. Other techniques, including uh, tissue transposition like muscle, momentum, pericardial fat, and uh, we can try to adopt fissureless approach for patients with fused fissure. And uh, we should minimize inspirational pressure when reinflating the lungs and uh, care for attention to avoid overlapping the staple lines. Because we know that if you overlap staple lines, the, the cross point will be more, 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 more prone to have leaking. And, uh, we have uh, three minutes uh, to go, just to let you All right, know. sure. I'll start through the managing, management of post-op air leak. So there are two schools of thoughts from uh, traditionally. One, one group of surgeons thinks we should apply external suction to achieve lung expansion to minimize the space. Well, another school of surgeons think we should avoid suction to promote healing of the pleura to reduce air leak. Uh, conventionally, these two thoughts have, has been combined. So traditionally, patient will be put on suction 20 cm water after the surgery until the, the normal air leak, then the patient will put on a simple water seal without suction. But uh, since the prevalence of lung volume reduction surgery, this, was, this su initial suction strategy was proven to be ineffective. So more studies come, up, come across and eventually the experts consensus nowadays suggest for patients with obstructive lung disease, they should be treated with no suctions. For other patients, they should be treated with the, it's reasonable to give a small, a brief period of low suction, either in the operating room itself or just overnight, and then we should remove the suctions. And that, that is our practice at the moment as well. And the uh, plural drainage system had advanced over the years also to help us uh, treat patients with prolonged air leak. Traditionally, the, the uh, underwater seal bottles, we can only detect air leaks by looking at the bubbles. It can be difficult to differentiate true parenchymal leak from just a momentum leak, a lung swinging. But the new digital drainage system, I have to quantify the leaks. They can record and retrieve the air leak trend and it makes us more promising to standardize practice across the surgeons. And uh, we all know there was a multi-center randomized trial of the digital versus conventional uh, drainage systems showing that the digital system significantly shortens air leak duration and chest duration. And uh, for, uh, we know for treatment wise, we know that most prolonged air leak will see over time. So watch for waiting will be successful in 98 of patients. And we know that it's, uh, for up, this patient can be managed outpatiently with the one-way valve back. Uh, if, you, if the patient somehow is not suitable for outpatient management, or you want the leak to be still faster, you can choose to give installation of blood or, or top powders around the tube. And uh, after, after all this, if all this fail, you can always go for invasive treatments, but I would say these are very rare. Uh, you can go for repeat exploration, surgical exploration and uh, artificial preventative pneumoperitoneum. You can also consider one way into bronchial valve. These valves are firstly developed for COPD treatment, uh, but has shown to have some effect in uh, prolonged air leak or bronchial fistula patients. But obviously it requires us a different, uh, different kind of expertise for which is not our territory at all. Uh, oh, that, here comes to my end of my start. Perfect talk. timing. Thank you. 15 minutes exactly. Thank you. Um, 
I just have a few comments um, to a lot of times people use the word bronchopril fistula quite regularly, uh, especially among um, the physicians. But I think it's important if, as thoracic surgeons, when we hear the word bronchopril fistula, we worry about the real bronchus, uh, proper uh, fistula in the bronchus. So what we generally deal with with yeah. addicts are actually alveoli pleural fistulas or peripheral lung fistulas. So uh, that's one very important term uh, we should uh, correct uh, um, our, our team and also our physicians um, uh, not to use that word so much. Uh, yeah. Does anybody agree or disagree with me here? Oh, yes, totally agree. You should use the term alveolar yeah. pleural yeah. yeah. So my second comment I wanted to say in management of uh, plural spaces is that uh, one of your slides stated that they use a phrenic nerve crushing of uh, I think that's something. Paralysis. Yeah, yeah that technique. Uh, I think was done during for thoracoplasty and uh, for TB those days. However, I, I don't think it in the in the era of modern thoracic surgery we should never ever paralyze the diaphragm permanently or crush the phrenic nerve. Uh, okay. In fact, we should take all our efforts to preserve the phrenic nerve. Um, and so uh, the use of uh, to maybe knock out the space at the initial phase of giving. A local anesthetic to the phrenic nerve. Um, we've used it a few times in our center and it's worked very well actually for the COPD patients with secondary pneumothorax. However, doing pneumo, pneumoperitoneum, uh, I think that puts a bit of a risk. Uh, you increase the mm -hmm. risk to the patient. And uh, yes, I know there was a study, but I think it was only a case study. I'm not sure if there's actually a, a RCT done about that. Um, and so it's a lot of RCT, it's the prospective uh, case series, yes, not really RCT. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't a lot of patients, I can't remember. No, it's not, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the last one I wanted to say is that the use of a suction versus no suction, um, there are two good meta-analysis out there. One that I can remember was published in uh, the Interactive Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery. And uh, they asked, they, they put a question out to say, should we use suction or no suction? And uh, the conclusion was that um, there, I mean, the, there was no sick, actual significance, but the, the, uh, the meta-analysis kind of skewed towards no suction. Mm. Um, and the only reason to put on suction is they, if they stop developing subcute emphysema, um, uh, if, they, if the pneumothorax is persistently collapsed, not just the apex, but even the periphery of the lung collapses, uh, they use that or the patient is symptomatic and breathless because the lung has collapsed. And a lot of times, if there's a big air leak and you put more suction onto them, uh, you actually keep the uh, the lung, the, the tear in the lung open longer, actually. And it causes, in fact, the lung to tear even more, probably. So um, uh, from that meta-analysis, it says that it's better to put on gravity mode or no suction uh, for those patients. Uh, but thank you for the talk. Uh, are there any comments from the floor? Regarding the suction, I think... Mm -hmm. uh, you can either use suction or not, but I think the first rule is that when you have problem, if you don't use suction, try suction. And if you okay. use suction at first place, if you've got problem, take the suction off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you, Dr. Harish. Thank you, uh, Prof. Panarak. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Any other comments from the panelists? Wait, it's getting late, so maybe we should move on to the next speaker. Yes, Susan, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, our last speaker will be my residence. Uh, Dr. Aditya is a junior uh, residence of um, uh, cardiothoracic and vascular surgery residency program, uh, Medical Faculty of University of Indonesia. Uh, during the last uh, one year, uh, my hospital became the, the top referral center for COVID. And, and sometimes we got consultation from the ICU, uh, COVID-19 patients with uh, subcutaneous emphysema or pneumomediastinum. That's why uh, my residents would like to uh, read a journal regarding uh, subcutaneous emphysema in COVID-19 patients. To Dr. Adit, time is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Susan. Uh, and thank you for all the panelists and um, the participants. 
uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Aditya Budiarso. I am a thoracic cardiac and vascular surgeon resident from University of Indonesia uh, in uh, National Respiratory Center, uh, Persahabatan. As Dr. Susan said, uh, in our hospital, in National Respiratory Center, Persahabatan, in maybe uh, one year, our hospital become a referral hospital for COVID-19 in Indonesia. Uh, we don't accept uh, many patients other than the COVID-19 patient. And in uh, our uh, one uh, year, we, uh, we in the Department of uh, Thoracic Surgery often get consultation uh, from the pulmonologist or from the uh, intensivist, uh, but the uh, subcutaneous uh, emphysema uh, with or without uh, penumentiastinum. This is uh, maybe with the background uh, for this presentation. This is in our hospital in January uh, 2021. There are uh, 73 uh, patients in ICU, and the three patients uh, was diagnosed with uh, subcutaneous emphysema with or without uh, pneumonium. And uh, the main one is uh, two patients uh, which use uh, mediastinostomy and one patient with conservative management. This is the data from February uh, 2021. Uh, 133 uh, ICU patients with six uh, subcutaneous uh, emphysema with little penicillin. Uh, we do uh, three mediastinostomy and uh, three conservative management. And in March, uh, until this is the data until 25th uh, March, uh, there are uh, 122 patients in ICU and three uh, patient consult uh, to us with subcutaneous emphysema and pneumonium with uh, three patients with uh, mediastinostomy and subcutaneous incision and three conservative management. So uh, from this that, uh, data, uh, we get that 4% uh, uh, of patients in the ICU, which use a ventilator, was uh, consulted with uh, subcutaneous emphysema and pneumonium mediastinum. Uh, so, from this uh, case, we interest to uh, uh, try to read the journal about the pneumonium and subcutaneous emphysema in uh, COVID-19, this barotrauma or uh, rung frailty. Uh, this is from the journal, the introduction or the journal is uh, many uh, COVID-19 patients were admitted to uh, ICU for the treatment for uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Despite, uh, we know that in uh, acute respiratory distress, uh, distress syndrome, the guideline for ventilatory management is protective criteria preventing uh, VILI, which is we use uh, low tidal volume and we use uh, low peak uh, plateau pressure, not more than uh, 30. But there is a high incidence of pneum and stenum and subcutaneous emphysema despite of uh, protective mechanical uh, ventilation protocol. Now, uh, the purpose of the study in this journal uh, was to determine if the incidence uh, and etiology of pneumonium and subcutaneous emphysema in COVID-19 patients. Is it because of the barotrauma or is it because of the lung frailty and um, uh, disorder of the structural in the lung? This is the uh, study design, the methods and the participants. The design is a cohort retrospective study. The inclusion criteria is age older than uh, 18 years old, uh, acute respiratory, respiratory distress syndrome, uh, diagnosed in uh, ICU admission, and use uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, in this study, there are two groups. The first group is uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome from the beginning of the COVID-19. Uh, so they uh, collect the data from uh, February 2020, where in uh, Europe is the first uh, pandemic era. And the uh, second group is uh, the IRDS uh, before the beginning of COVID-19. They collect the data from uh, January uh, 2015 until uh, February 2019. And the uh, diagnosis of COVID-19 used uh, real-time uh, PCR for uh, COVID-19. And uh, pneumonium and subcutaneous emphysema was confirmed using the completed tomography or chest radiograph. 
Uh, this is the outcome, measure, and explanatory uh, variable uh, of this study. This is the pneumonia genome, uh, in the baseline characteristic, we will see the age, sex, uh, BMI, uh, comorbidities, and uh, mechanical ventilator. In mechanical ventilator, what the variable, this is the variable from mechanical ventilator, is uh, first is positive and expiratory pressure, peak airway pressure, plateau pressure, uh, arterial carbon dioxide tension, uh, arterial oxygen tension, uh, per inspiratory fraction, uh, compliance of respiratory system, minute ventilation, and tidal volume. The statistical analysis uh, they used in the study is viable, presented with frequency and percentage for the categorical variable, and they use the statistical analysis uh, performed with R4 team. This is uh, the difference in explanatory variable. These were a uh, high square test or feature test for dichotomies and categorical variable. The test for normally di distributed continuous variable and man Whitney uh, for non uh, normal distributed continuous variable. Okay, uh, this is the results of the study. Now, uh, this is uh, the, the table show us the baseline characteristic uh, from this study. Uh, between uh, COVID-19 uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome and non-COVID-19 acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, we can see in this uh, group, in the COVID-19 acute respiratory distress syndrome, there are uh, 23 patients uh, from 169 with uh, developed pneumonia or uh, subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, in non-COVID uh, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, the pneumonia and subcutaneous emphysema just uh, three out of uh, 163 uh, patients. And if we see in this uh, table, we can see the uh, positive in expiratory uh, pressure between the COVID-19 acute respiratory distress syndrome and non-COVID-19 uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome was uh, quite different with the p-value uh, less than uh, 0 0.001. Uh, in uh, COVID uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome patient, uh, the, uh, were ventilated with higher uh, positive and expiratory pressure and lower uh, tidal volume per ideal uh, body weight than in non-COVID non uh, RDS. In a compliance for the respiratory system, uh, we see in uh, uh, partial oxygen and per uh, fraction oxygen is in lower in the COVID-19 than in the non-COVID-19 uh, acute respiratory distress uh, syndrome. But in uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, partial pressure, uh, we can see that in the COVID-19 patient was higher than the non-COVID-19 uh, acute respiratory distress uh, syndrome. Now, from the data uh, from the acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, with COVID-19, and with, uh, we can compare the case uh, without pulmonary uh, pneumonia genome so is 146, and with pneumonia genome. Uh, and so potentially emphysema, we can see in this previous uh, table is 23. Now, uh, the difference of the only significant difference between uh, these two groups is uh, just the lower minute ventilation on the day of ICU admission. We can see that no difference in uh, positive and expiratory pressure between uh, in COVID-19 between uh, pneumonia genome and without uh, pneumonia genome. You can see it here. In the uh, peak air pressure, there's no difference, and in plateau pressure, there's no difference. Only three and uh, four. Yes, the difference just uh, lower minute ventilation on the day of ICU admission. Uh, this is about the variable about uh, mechanical ventilation and gas exchange. Uh, we can see that the uh, positive and expiratory pressure and plateau pressure were lower on the day. Which uh, pneumonia and genome and subcutaneous emphysema develop on the ICU admission? You can see on the first day of the mechanical ventilation was uh, higher than the day where the uh, pneumonia and genome uh, was diagnosed. This is this. Uh, okay, the tidal volume was significantly uh, slightly increased. 
Okay, next for the discussion. Uh, the cause of pneumonia sinum uh, is a multifactorial, but the famous one we know is uh, pulmonary baru trauma. Because the pulmonary baru trauma in uh, acute respiratory disease syndrome is related with high airway pressure associated with high tidal volume. Maybe uh, uh, 20 uh, in, uh, cc per kilogram ideal body weight. But in uh, COVID-19 IRDS patient, as we see in the previous table, the average plateau pressure was uh, 23 centimeter uh, water, which is the lower value than the threshold for the protective uh, lung strategy. We know the protective lung strategy recommended that the uh, plateau pressure not more than uh, 30 uh, centimeter water. In the tidal volume in a patient with pneumonia sinum uh, in COVID-19, the tidal volume was lower. This is the 5.9 uh, uh, kilogram idle body weight. Uh, this is lower than the uh, recommended in lung protective strategy. We know the uh, lung protective strategy recommended uh, 6 until 77.5. Uh, the patient uh, who developed pneumonia sinum or subcutaneous erythema had similar airway pressure on the day of ICU admission to patient who did not develop uh, pneumonia sinum. And airway pressure was lower on the day with where uh, pneumonia sinum or subcutaneous erythema diagnosed uh, compared when the uh, day the patient first admit to uh, ICU and first uh, use uh, mechanical ventilator. Now, uh, considering this, pneumonia sinum and subcutaneous uh, emphysema in COVID-19 acute respiratory distress syndrome in this study does not appear to be associated with the classic baro trauma mechanism. We know the term baro trauma maybe uh, must uh, have a, a high airway pressure, so uh, there are uh, air outside uh, tracheal bronchial tree. Uh, because uh, we see that the airway pressure in COVID-19 uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome was not high, so uh, the barotrauma uh, we can uh, exclude. So the underlying disease is considered for the cause of pneumonia sinum or subcutaneous emphysema. Maybe it's because of absolute pulmonary disease or because of uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So uh, in this study, the uh, pneumonia sinum and uh, subcutaneous emphysema it's not due to the uh, baro trauma, but uh, more because of uh, lung frailty, uh, the lower compliance of the lung, and maybe uh, develop emphysema in the uh, airway in, because of COVID-19. Uh, we can see if we uh, see the uh, CT scan in patient with COVID-19, there's a grand glass uh, opacity, uh, airspace consolidation, but bronchovascular thickening and dilatation of the tracheal bronchial tree. Uh, uh, this is underlying. Uh, this is the underlying disease, underlying cause uh, for the pneumonia sinum and uh, subcutaneous emphysema in uh, COVID-19 uh, patient. The pathophysiological process characterized uh, by after uh, rupture, air dissection along the bronchovascular sheet, and the spreading of pulmonary interstitial emphysema into the media sinum. Nah, uh, the high incidence of uh, pneumonia sinum in the COVID-19 is so worrying and deserve a careful uh, assessment. The mortality rate is not significantly different in this uh, study patient with uh, without uh, pneumonia sinum uh, and spontaneous emphysema. But the future study should focus on follow up the surviving patient who develop pneumonia sinum and spontaneous uh, emphysema. This is essential for determining the effect of long term outcomes and the prognosis of the uh, incident of uh, pneumonia sinum and uh, spontaneous uh, emphysema in COVID 19 patients. Okay, maybe uh, that's uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you for all the panelists. Thank you very much, Dr. Adit, for the nice presentations. Um, please, to all panelists and attendees who would like to ask any questions or comments or sharing experience, maybe. Dr. Punarek, do you have any comments? I don't have uh, experience taking care of those, you know, COVID patients. Uh, but yes, I think the 
I think the the poor is uh, afraid of this this uh, effect, so they try to avoid using what's the pressure ventilation with the ventilator. Try to use the you know front position and lower down the pressure. Yes, I think this is not not a case of the the true barotrauma. Yes, yes, that's what we got from this little video. And uh, our uh, our role as surgeon is not so much in these cases. Um, mainly conservative, only in certain patients uh, we did a uh, mediastinostomy. There's a question from the uh, Kathian. Uh, would you like to answer that uh, regarding the subcutaneous incision? Oh, the subcutaneous incisions. Uh, uh, was not performed by us. It it was performed by the pulmonologist. Yeah, uh, we only do the the mediastinostomy. Thank you. Have, usually, usually they made it multiple. Yes, I have done once. Uh, so any any place where the tension is the most. Uh, in you know any, any place, usually usually multiple incision. Yeah, but we didn't do it anymore. Uh, no other questions. When do you do the mediastinostomy in this case, uh, Doctor Adit? Would you like to uh, answer the questions? Yeah, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, in our hospital, we. Uh, then the uh, mediastinostomy will procedure if uh, in a patient uh, there are uh, subcutaneous emphysema and pneumodestinum. And the subcutaneous emphysema, uh, we do if, uh, massive subcutaneous emphysema. Maybe if the uh, skin was uh, dilated like a balloon and then the, there are a compromise of hemodynamic uh, in the pneumodestinum. So uh, we do the uh, uh, media synostomy. But if the subcutaneous emphysema was not mass, uh, massive and uh, uh, there are uh, no compromise in hemodynamic, we use the conservative uh, management. Like in the maybe in the guidelines, if we search the guidelines with, with the, because the conservative management with uh, optimization of uh, ventilator, uh, bronchodilator was uh, enough for. To uh, reduce the subcutaneous uh, emphysema and pneumodestinum. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Adit, there is another question from uh, Professor Agastian. How often do you need to put chest tube in COVID 19 intubated patients during your uh, round in persahabatan in three months? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor and Doctor, for uh, the question. Uh, in our uh, my rotation in uh, National Respiratory Center to Sabaitan in three months, uh, maybe you, we uh, perform uh, three uh, chest tube insertion in patient with uh, uh, pneumothorax in uh, COVID-19 patient. This is uh, what uh, we done. Uh, we use uh, you uh, insert the chest tube, but uh, we uh, the thoracic. Uh, Department of Thoracic Surgeon consult to insert uh, the chest tube in the patient with pneumothorax and uh, pneumomediastinum and uh, subcutaneous emphysema. If uh, just pneumothorax, the uh, pulmonologist in our hospital uh, can perform the chest tube insertion. But in uh, our uh, three months, we uh, insert uh, maybe three uh, chest tube. Uh, in the patient with uh, COVID-19 and in the uh, pneumothorax pneumomediastinum. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, so actually, I don't know the real incidence of pneumothorax in COVID-19 patients in my hospital because um, the patient uh, are hand, handled by the pulmonologist. They only consult to us sometimes in the severe cases or in the cases uh, which they uh, feel complicated to insert the chest tube. Thank you. Uh, another question. In doing mediastinostomy, do you insert a tube 
or a catheter. Please, Dr. Adit, uh, how is your experience in persahabatan? Okay, thank you. In uh, our experience uh, in media, uh, tenostomy, uh, we done an uh, incision in the uh, 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 jugular notch, and we uh, done a median tenostomy, and we just uh, leave a drain, uh, like a drain hand spoon, to uh, leave the uh, incision open. So the air can uh, escape from the uh, mediastinum. We don't uh, insert uh, any uh, tube on the mediastinum because uh, from our experience with just uh, the incision and uh, drain uh, with a uh, hand spoon drain to uh, lift the incision open is uh, enough to uh, reduce the subcutaneous emphysema and pneumonia stenum. Thank you, Dr. Okay, and hopefully this is the last questions. Which one do you prefer, mediastinostomy or insert the chest tube in subcutaneous emphysema? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, 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 this is from uh, our experience again. In our experience, uh, if the subcutaneous emphysema uh, develop, develop with massive uh, subcutaneous emphysema and there are uh, pneumonia stenum with compromised hemodynamic, uh, we prefer uh, media stenostomy. But if there is uh, uh, incidence of pneumothorax in the uh, pneumothorax and pneumonia stenum, uh, we insert the chest tube so uh, the air can escape from the uh, tube. But if there uh, is no pneumothorax, just uh, uh, supernatural emphysema, we prefer uh, you just use uh, media stenostomy because it's uh, enough uh, without uh, uh, insert the chest tube. Okay, uh, to the attendees, thank you, and to the panelists, thank you very much for for the questions. Uh, and to Dr. Aditya, congratulations for the presentations. And you, I will give to Dr. Punarek, please, Dr. Punarek. Thank you very much um, for everyone. Um, this is the first time we tried this journal club. And I think it should be better next time. And soon, uh, you still here with us? Soon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about the next activities? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you to all panelists. And thank you to the presenters as well. Well done. Uh, very informative uh, session. Um, next month, uh, the last Monday, of April, I think it's the 26th, if I'm not wrong. We're gonna do an interesting videos uh, session. So if you have any interesting videos that you would like to present and share, please uh, send it in to, uh, to seats. You can send it in to the website itself, or you could send it in, uh, or you could just mention it on the um, seats discussion group. And uh, I will get in contact with you and we can organize the, uh, to shortlist the video and to see uh, how uh, appropriate uh, it is. But I do encourage all the residents out there, this is uh, your society. So please uh, feel free to be involved. All videos are, um, will be taken into consideration. And so if you have any interesting techniques out there or anything that you want to share and show the world, uh, please feel free. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much once again to all the panelists and to all the uh, presenters and to all the audience. Thank you for uh, attending. I will see you next month. No, thank you everyone, Every, especially our residents. Well done. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye mm -hmm. everyone. Bye-bye.